privilege of coming to visit you again this afternoon. I don't know what it is about Fountain in the City, but I do enjoy coming here. I mean, I know the people are friendly, but I've been to other churches with friendly people. Uh, the sermons are good. I always learn something when Pastor Barrett is teaching, so I really enjoy listening to you and sitting uh, at your feet to learn. Um, I don't know what it is. I know the parking is difficult. It takes me about 15 minutes once I find a park to come here. And this afternoon, for the first time, I had to go around the block about four times before I found a park. No one had located the park. Maybe I didn't pray enough to start off with. I don't know what it was. But anyway, I found a park eventually. And it's my privilege. It's the second time that I'm here. The last time I was here was, I think, the 18th of um, May, which would be about four weeks ago now. So I thank you for the privilege of inviting me back. It's always a good sign when you get a second invitation. If you don't get a second invitation, that's, that's fine, but I appreciate the opportunity. The last time I spoke specifically about some of my experiences with people I have interviewed who have been persecuted uh, from around the world, out of Africa, even into uh, China. This time I'm going to take a slightly different slant. We're going we're gonna to take a three angels' messages view of persecution. Because we know as Adventists, when we study history and we look at the Reformation, which brought an end to persecution in a big way. And we also look at prophecy. There was persecution in the past. We know there will be persecution in the future. What voice of the martyrs made me aware of that there's persecution now. But I want to let you know that Adventists have been persecuted in the past. And typically, when you look at persecuted people, especially in communist countries and that, and some of them will come through the movie at 5.30, you'll find that Adventists actually get more persecuted than other religions. And the reason for that is, can anyone guess? The Sabbath Sunday issue, that's right, because they refuse to work on Sabbath. And when they're in labor camps, because of their faith, because they're Christians, they will refuse to work. So in the movie, I think it's Adventism by itself is mentioned once in the subtitles there, in the movie, uh, when Sabrina Wormbrand is actually captured and she's in a labor camp. And then they look on a hill and there are a group of people being beaten. They lose track of what day of the week it was, except that they knew when it was Saturday or when it was Sabbath, because that's when the Adventists would refuse to work and they would get beaten. So at least one day a week they will figure out that's the right day. So they'll actually say it must be Saturday again because the Adventists are being beaten again for their faith. So um, I want to talk a little bit about persecution, but we're going to take a, a broad view, a helicopter view, so to speak, and every now and then we'll come down and just look at the topography a little bit closer. But I want to give you just a, a big picture view in general. What I've discovered, we have a, a framework of truth in the Adventist church which is second to none. And the more I study it, the more I see linkages that I didn't see in the past. So I pray that God will bless you as we spend time together, as we look at the Word, look at history, look at persecution. Um, and the reason I'm sharing a bit of history with you is just simply that people, when they forget their history, they're destined to repeat the mistakes of the past. And uh, this is one thing that history does teach us, doesn't it? History teaches us that history teaches us what? Nothing. Because we forget our history so often and then we just keep on repeating the same mistakes over and over. So we need to remember our history and we will be encouraged through this uh, program to do that. But just before I continue, I just invite you to uh, bow with me for a word of prayer. <coughs> Gracious Father in heaven, it's always a privilege to be with your people, Father. We come from different walks of life, but you have united us into faith. You have drawn us through present truth. And Father, we're so grateful for Jesus, we're grateful for the Holy Spirit, even the holy angels that work in our lives through your word. And Father, as we now look at aspects of history, we look at aspects of the word, and also the three angels' messages, Father, we just pray for the illumination of your Holy Spirit. Give us clarity of thought and understanding as we spend time together. May you bless us, Father, may we, we, we finished here, Father, we know that we have spent time with you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> I want to tell you a little story about uh, history, and I want to start in the Old Testament of the book of Joshua. Now, how many people had had a chance to look at the lesson, or were here during the lesson this morning? I missed a part of the lesson because I was doing laps around the block, but my wife was here. There was a text in uh, Joshua, it might have been under Wednesday section, it might have been Tuesday or Wednesday section, where they quoted out of Joshua chapter 2, and spoke about the importance of knowing history. And if you forget your history, quite often you will even forget the God of history as well. God is the God that inhabits eternity, but it includes history and also includes the future. That's why we have prophecy. And I want to go to Joshua chapter 2, and I just want to look at a couple of verses there. Joshua chapter 2. It says, Now Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. 
So where are they at the moment? Are they outside of the promised land? Are they still in the wilderness? Or are they in the promised land? In the promised land. They're in the promised land. God had promised to their fathers that He will take them to the promised land and they will possess it as an inheritance. Although that was just in time because ultimately the new earth is the one that was actually promised. And then in verse 10 it says, So when all that generation that had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which He had done for Israel. Now, is it possible that you could lose all that information in one generation? Yeah. Well, it's possible, yeah. But they actually were aware of it. If you look in, in the, the book, um, I think it's Patriarchs and Prophets, we actually learned there that it's not that they weren't aware of it. They just didn't really spend much time, didn't contemplate it much. Matter of fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, they are encouraged to spend time in the book of the law to review the history. And not only that, to teach their children. In regards to the law, even when they're lying down and they're sitting up and they're walking by the wayside. But it looked like a generation of people that have had that knowledge, that first hand experience, who were eyewitnesses of what God was able to do, they have not passed on that knowledge efficiently. And if they had, the second generation didn't seem to be that interested. So, what am I saying to you based on this text? It's important for us to know our history. And I believe that there is an ignorance of history quite often within Adventism because we don't really know our past history. So my encouragement to you today is that we need to know a little bit more about our history. It's very important. You'll see why in a moment. But I want to go back to history. And the reason I'm doing this, something terrible happened. I think it was about 1921 in America. And that history is, most people are almost unaware of because it was, it was buried. The information on that was buried. And that history is of a place called Black Wall Street. How many of you have heard of Black Wall Street? Okay, well, I was ignorant of Black Wall Street until not too long ago myself. If you want to know about Black Wall Street, go on to YouTube and then Google Black Wall Street. You'll find that uh, John uh, Bradshaw, from it is written, did a half-hour program on it. And this is where about 300 people were killed. Very affluent neighborhood, affluent black society. Um, they were in an area where the Ku Klux Klan was very active. I think they had over 1,000 men members in that area. And then because of a misunderstanding of a young man climbing into a lift with a, a white girl, he was a dark girl, and he was going up to the top floor of this uh, building to use the facilities because it was whites only and blacks only. In the lift, somehow the lift sh shook and jarred and she fell forwards and uh, then she screamed. And when she screamed, um, he realized that potentially he could be in trouble. So then he ran out of the lift and fled. And uh, what happened is people had heard the screams and they saw him running and put two and two together, got the wrong information. Later the lady actually said that um, he had not touched her at all, but in spite of that they wanted to have a public lynching, they wanted to kill this, this young guy. And then from there things escalated and then there was this, where they just wiped out this whole block of affluent uh, businesses. And no one seems to know about that history. Now we are in 2019, this is 1921, that's 98 years since that, and no one seems to know anything about it. Only go and watch it, it's a fascinating story. So history is important for us. I want to tell you a story of history that also happened. In America, around the turn of the previous century, so uh, talking about end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, there were quite a few natural disasters and a few man-made disasters, big disasters, huge and uh, we quite often forget about them, except if you go and visit these places, sometimes there's a little museum there that will tell you about it, but otherwise the information is not readily available. So I want to tell you about the South Fork Dam and Lake Covenant. Now, this, uh, this dam was uh, 21 kilometers above another town called the Johnstown. And Johnstown had a big flood, they called it the Great Flood of 1889 where 2,209 people were killed during this flood. A massive flood. I mean, unbelievable flood. Um, matter of fact, there's only two other disasters that have actually claimed more lives than the Johnstown flood, the Great Flood. That was the 1900, um, they had a big hurricane come through. That wiped out about 8,000 people. Some people say between 6 and 12 because the records weren't as great back then. But they suggest typically they say 8,000 people killed, were killed in that, in that hurricane. And of course the other one where 2,298 people died, you know what I'm talking about? Yep, 9-11. That's the other one that actually had greater ca casualties. But apart from that, this was the biggest disaster in, in, um, in the US history. So what had happened is they were building canals. And at that time a lot of shipments were taking place by canals and they were building this and they ended up building this dam on the Commonwealth River. 
And what happened is this started being built in about 1838. By around about 1853, sorry, they started getting into rail. And then rail overtook canal shipments. And then what happened is the, the people who were building that ended up selling it to the, to the railway. And the people there who had built the dam didn't, they didn't quite finish the job well. It was a dam designed by earth and rock. So it wasn't cement or anything like that. And they just dammed up this water and they had these five um, sluices, you know, big pipes where they can release the water just to regulate the, the flow. Because with the dam bulk with just earth and rock, if the water starts flowing over the top, it will erode the dam very quickly and the dam bulk could give way. So very important that they had those sluices there. Anyway, this dam um, actually had a leak in uh, around about 1860, 1862. It wasn't really well designed. And then in repairing that, that breach of the dam wall, they had ripped out some of the pipes and sold it the scrap metal and never replaced it. So the ability then to regulate the, the flow and the level of the water was a huge problem for them. Anyway, they ended up selling this to some very wealthy people uh, some 20 years later. And, and they had this exclusive club, they called it the, uh, the South Fork Dam um, Recreational Area, an exclusive club, and all the rich and wealthy from Pittsburgh went there. So people like Andrew Carnegie were part of it, and some other many very famous people, and they ended up building some really beautiful homes there. They then lowered the dam wall, uh, low enough so they could go wide enough to have a two-way lane there for their carriages. Because it was about a two-hour train trip from Pittsburgh to get to the station at, uh, near Johnstown. And then from there, of course, they'd take the carriage up and they would spend their weekends there. It was a beautiful climate in, uh, in summer. Winter, they'd have a little bit of snow, but they would have sailboats and all kinds of things there. And it was a very prestigious place. They used to refer to their, you know, their, their cabin on the lake, but these were like multi-story buildings, three-story buildings with 14 rooms on average. Uh, very affluent. They, however, never maintained the wall. So what happens is around 1880, one of the people who are working in the steelworks down the bottom, the town had now grown in Johnstown to about 30,000 people. So it's a good sized town, it would be like a small city. Um, they sent a, a person up there, an engineer, who was also a, um, what do you call the people that study soil and dirt and land and all that sort of stuff? Geologist, Geologist thank you. Geologist. And uh, he went there and investigated what was going on, then realized that the pipes were never replaced to, um, to work through the, uh, the flow and to, 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 to uh, manage the, uh, the dam levels. And then he also found out that uh, the dam wall had actually started to sagging a bit where they used to travel. That's just another photo of what the dam uh, looked like. This is the man here, his name was John Fulton. He went and then he said this was a disaster waiting to happen because this dam was not very safe. Now this is in 1880, so this report was given there, and it was 1889 that the big disaster took place. So this was nine years earlier where they were warned, but no one paid attention to the warning. From time to time when they had a bit of rain, someone would say, look, a potential flood will be coming, they'll send some information downstream to the towns, and then uh, nothing would happen. The problem was, though, that they were in quite a steep valley, and from time to time, there was just regular flooding from rain anyway. So the town sometimes would get flooded, you know, the main street would become a bit of a stream and a bit of a river down, in, down the flood without the dam wall being breached. So they ended up living with this. On top of that, the, uh, the leftover uh, rubbish, the dirt, there's a word for it, that they uh, used to get from the steelworks, they would take and then dump and then extend the land a little bit further so they could actually build it because they were between... Uh, two cliff faces, basically, two mountain ranges, there wasn't a lot of space. So they built their um, industry very close to the river. And in the process of doing that, they actually halved the size of the river, and the river flowed and narrowed it, and that also caused some problems sort of down the track. So this photo is one I do photo uh, grab off uh, the History Channel, but it's not very clear. It's a very old photo. I mean, it's a Roughly about 100 years old, right? But if you can see, that is the top of the dam wall. They made it wide enough for, for carriages to go and backwards and forwards on both sides. But can you see there's a little bit of a dip there? Now, when they did this originally, that was level. So you can see there's some erosion taking place in the dam wall, and people were not too worried about it for some reason. I don't know why they weren't worried, but they, they lived with this. Anyway, so the rain starts pouring from the 28th of March. There's this low pressure system that builds, and as it gains momentum and comes towards them, there's incessant rain. They get um, 
10 inches, there's a 250 millimeters in uh, less than 24 hours. And the, the morning of the 31st of March, sorry, 31st of May, when the, the man who used to run the club wakes up, he sees the dam is about to breach, it's, it's going to start flowing through that little centerpiece there. He sees that the dam is actually gaining an inch, that's 25 millimeters, every, every 10 minutes. So they're gaining like 6 inches, 15 centimeters every hour. So he gets some people in there, they try and cover up with rocks and mud and that was when all the soils went, they've got no proper way of, of fixing this. Then they start sending some telegraph, but with the storm and the rain, some of the telegraph poles are down, so they've got to send it downstream to the nearest town and from there send the telegraph down to the people who are in Johnstown. Now in Johnstown they actually receive the telegraphs, the, the messages are understood, but the messages are ignored. Twice messages are sent via, you know, Morse code down to them to let them know there's still an imminent danger. But they had received this so often that they just simply ignore them. They go, oh, look, we've heard this before. We think we're fine. We think we're safe. It sort of reminds me a little bit of Pompeii. You know, people know there was some imminent disaster, but they just ignored it. Well, this is what happened here as well. And then around about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the, 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 the dam wall was breached. And within a matter of minutes, the whole dam wall gave way. So there's a ton of water, they say 14 million cubic um, meters of water flooded down and the, and the dam was drained within a matter of about 40 to 15 minutes. And that, as the water came down, it hit a, a town, uh, the first town that actually hit, we just even remember the name of the, uh, of the town, it was called the yeah, South Fork Town. There it actually uh, either washed away 30 houses or they were destroyed and there were about 30 people 60 people that lived there, four people lost their lives in the process. Some were able to escape and run up the, uh, up the road. Then after that, it came to the, the Conmana Viaduct. Now, this Conmana Viaduct had these arches built, and as it was picking up debris and tree and animals and houses and everything, that actually pushed against this uh, viaduct, and it was able to, to stem the flow of the water for a while. Only for seven minutes. The only problem is, of course, when you stem water and it keeps on coming down, you build up more power and more energy and when finally the, uh, the viaduct uh, gave way all this water and debris went down and, and washed down. By the time it came down to the, the, uh, the town down there people weren't able to, to survive. Some ran, some were able to save their own lives but many people were washed away, some people even in their houses. So you have this rubble and debris floating. It doesn't look like water anymore, they were saying it looked more just like a, a mass of rubble and earth and dirt and even locomotives, I think 21 locomotives were carried away by this water. And uh, then it ended up pushing against the uh, stone bridge down in Johnstown and this is a depiction of what it looked like. Somewhere in one of those houses there must have been a kerosene lamp or something burning because what happened there was a massive fire. And people were trying to escape but the, the, the crush and the push of all the debris coming together, they couldn't escape. And there were eyewitnesses of people trying to run on top of the debris to get away. Some people just couldn't. And there's even stories of people thinking, well, I'm going to die. I may as well just die fast, falling backwards into the fire, just to, so they could die quickly. A massive disaster. So what was, the, um, what was the issue? They were told nine years earlier that there was an imminent disaster because the dam wall had not been maintained whatsoever. And the safety devices that had been put in originally had been taken out. All the five sluices and the pipes had been taken out. Um, the warning was sent twice by telegraph down to the, the, the people there. They received the information, they understood it, but they had ignored it. So I'm saying is, what can we learn from this? I think there's something we can learn from it in seven-day minutes. And I want to uh, just tell you a little bit more about the story. This is a, uh, a photo of the, uh, a bit of the aftermath there. There's some other photos if you go online as well where you can see massive trees being pushed through houses, sticking out of the houses. I mean, these are giant trees through uh, two and three story houses uh, and this was the biggest disaster so the lady that, that started the Red Cross she was there for about five months working and just helping these people setting up hospitals and so on it was a massive massive disaster and I said there's only two other disasters bigger than this ever in the history of America 9-11 was one where there was about 700 more people that died and then of course that big massive hurricane in the 1900s Ella White encourages us to know our history. This is a very famous statement by her. And she says that the Review and Herald, this was right, written in 1905. She goes, we have nothing to fear for the future, except we shall forget. 
Now, what are we not to forget? Is he talking about, what's he talking about? Talking about forgetting our doctrines? Or is there something else that we need to remember as well as our doctrines? It says, except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. So knowing God's leadings and his teachings in our past history is very important. We need to know the past to understand what the future is. Matter of fact, if you have you've read the book Great Controversy. Okay, yes, yeah, a good number. Praise God. That's a great book. I mean, people's lives have been changed in that. And I know many people have become pastors, become uh, Christians and Seventh-day Adventists from reading that book. But you know that the history, the first half of the book is basically history. That is not a uh, comprehensive history. The history that has been selected there by Ellen White in that book is to help us understand what will happen in the future. I don't know if you know that. If you read the introduction, it's very clear that that history is to give us the knowledge and understanding to decipher prophecy. So history is very important. Uh, I, I mentioned Judges chapter 2. I just want to repeat that again. When a generation dies and they don't pass on their history, what happens to the other generation? We've seen it time and time again. They forget their God. They forget the God that they serve and also the doctrines and the teachings of the past. And we are encouraged by Spirit of Prophecy to remember that. This is from Sermons and Talks, volume 1, page 387. It says, I know from the light that God has given me that there should be a revival of the messages that have been given in the past. Because men will seek to bring in new theories and will try to prove that these theories are scriptural. Okay, so we have some truths of the past that are important for us to remember. And if anything, if we discover new truth, they should build on the old truths, right? And she talks about the platform of truth as we continue reading. Whereas, they are not actually truth, they are error, which if allowed a yeah, place, they will undermine the faith in the truth. And we are not to accept these suppositions and pass them along as truth. No, no. We must not move from the platform of truth on which we have been established. So very important for us to know what the teachings were in the past. Remember what was the, the quote from Alan White? We are to remember the way the Lord has led us and His past teachings in our history. And here she says we are not to move from that platform of truth. Now, uh, Pastor Barr before was talking about uh, the Antichrist. He was talking about uh, Daniel chapter 7. Now, the man of sin, the son of perdition, is the same person as the Antichrist. And the Apostle Paul talks about him in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And after he identifies the falling away, the apostasy that happens in the church to set up the man of sin, the son of perdition, then there's a statement afterwards here towards about the end of time, and I think the time in which we are living, but also stemming into the future. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're reading verse 8, sorry, verse 10 to 12. It says that these people are deceived because they did not receive what? A love of the truth. Is it important to love the truth? The truth is very important, isn't it? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So it's not it's more than just loving doctrines. It's loving a person who is the truth as well. But doctrine is very important because these are the teachings of Jesus. It is the testimony of Jesus. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. When it says God will send them strong delusions, in what way will God send them strong delusions? He will only withdraw His... Holy Spirit, which they've rejected, and then He will allow them to be deceived by these strong delusions which are on the, on the earth. So God actually now just leaves them to their own devices. That's pretty much what it means. And then verse 12, that they all may be condemned who did not believe what? The truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Especially in our days, set you free from what? Well, deception. And there's so much deception around. And there will be more deception as time goes on. They did not believe the truth, they did not love the truth, but they had pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. Well, sin, that's right. All unrighteousness is sin, we are told in First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5. Okay, so moving on. I want to read you this interesting statement here. I, I just find it very fascinating. The importance of knowing our history. This is, was written in 1893. Brethren and sisters, would that it might say something to awaken you to the importance of this time and significance of the events that are now taking place. Something was happening in 1893 which you thought was significant and was very important. How many years since 1893 for us? Almost 130 roughly, isn't it? 120... Yeah, yeah, less, honest four, 126, something like that. That's right. 
So something was happening there at, the, at, at that time, and we want to figure out if we can see what it is. It says, I point you to the aggressive movements now being made for the restriction of religious liberty. She's writing in the U.S., she's writing to a U.S. audience at the time, Seventh-day Adventist. She says, I want to point you to this time, the significance of the events that are taking place. And there's something that she's talking about that's very important, the restriction of religious liberty. And we want to unpack and see if we can figure out what was happening at that time. Keep, keep on going in the, same, uh, in the same book, in the same page, a paragraph. So God's sanctified memorial has been torn down. She doesn't say will be torn down. Now what sanctified memorial would we be talking about? I should do what Pastor Byron does and do a, a few verses at a time because you can probably see it up there, right? The Sabbath, it says, And in its place a false Sabbath, bearing no sanctity, stands before the world. And while the powers of darkness are stirring up the elements from beneath, the Lord God of heaven is sending power from above to meet the emergency by arousing the living agencies to exalt the law of heaven. So what was happening at that time? Sunday was being agitated in a big way. Matter of fact, a Sunday law had been introduced, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. Actually, we'll touch on it now. In 1893, there was a World Fair being held in Chicago. It was called the Columbian World Exhibition. And leading up to this, there was a lot of effort and time being going to set up the whole place, to set up all the props and everything else that goes with it, and uh, the infrastructure. And then there was an issue where some of the Christians would be, were upset that they were working seven days a week to meet their deadline. So they were working you know, from Sunday through to Saturday. And some of the churches then moved on uh, Congress there to bring in a law to stop Congress from funding this endeavor unless people stopped working on Sunday. Now, what was the basis of that law that they were trying to promulgate? It was the fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath commandment. Mm -hmm. Except it didn't apply to the seventh day, they applied it to the first day of the week. And they used the law to actually substantiate the fact that they would actually remove funding, government would remove funding, based on the violation of the Fourth Commandment if they continued working on Sunday. So at that time now, they saw, especially the Adventists who were studying prophecy, were seeing that prophecy was being fulfilled, that there was actually now a Sunday law in place, and this was the beginning of war, this was just about the beginning. But 30 years earlier, a National Reform Association, the NRA at that time, was also set up, and they were working very hard, these people, to amend the Constitution of the U.S. to enforce a Sunday law. Now, the, the Constitution in the U.S. has uh, amendments that they've added to it. The first amendment is the one that actually guarantees religious freedom. Also, freedom of the press. How many of you in the last few weeks have noticed that the police have raided some of our uh, the journalists and even the ABC? Um, that, under the American Constitution, would not happen. They don't have the right to do that. But anyway, it's happened here. And uh, I was talking to my niece, she's uh, studied commerce and now she's studying law and she says that our freedoms and our rights are actually quite thin here because we do not have a bill of rights as such. I felt a little bit safer until she told me that, maybe it's a little bit thinner than we think, but anyway. Um, then also, at that time, right, so we're talking about the time that Elamite says that there's movements afoot now which is undermining the Sabbath, it's putting in another Sabbath. At the time, there was also a lot of persecution of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, the persecution was specifically in regards to the Sabbath Sunday issue. Um, any ideas? I mean, how many of you have studied or know about any Adventists being arrested for violating Sunday laws? Any of you aware of any of that? No. Okay. Well, if you have a guess, I mean, it wasn't a massive thing, but there was a number of people. Between, let's put the year, between 1878... And 1900, so a period of 22 years, 22 years, how many Adventists do you think would have been arrested for breaking Sunday laws in the U.S.? Just take a guess. 400. 400, okay, well not quite that much, it was actually 250. 250 Seventh-day Adventists were being arrested, and this was across 13 states. I've got all the names here, from Alabama, Arkansas, right through to Tennessee, Texas, and Washington. Now, uh, there was a massive agitation for Sunday law, 28 attempts to bring in a national Sunday law from 1888 to 1900 in America as well. So all these things were, were, were big headline news in America, and you can see what Alan White is talking about. Also around the world, there were arrests in many countries for breaking Sunday law. So this was not only a US thing, and I'm going to read all these countries to you, I'm just going to mention 14. Starting with, 
the alphabet starting with A, Australia, Canada, Chile, Great Britain, Greece, Germany, France, Norway, Russia, Singapore, South Africa, Switzerland, Sweden, Scotland. All these countries had arrested Seventh-day Adventists for breaking Sunday laws. So this was a global thing. It was not just a national thing in the U.S. So when they're talking about things that are happening at that time, you can see why they are talking about that. If you're a student of prophecy, all the events have been fulfilled, even more so than we see them right now. So why are we still here 100 years plus and there hasn't been this major persecution development around the world? We want to try and figure that out as we go along, right? This is a story. This is Mr. Jude Fine. He was a member of the Seventh day Adventist Church, right? And he was arrested in Kent County on November 20, 1892, on the charge of husking corn out of the shop on Sunday. The complaining witness was uh, Reverend Mr. Rowe, pastor of the Methodist Episcopal Church at Rock Hall. Now, I know what corn is, but I, and I know what a husk is, but I didn't know what a shop was. Does anyone know what a shop is? No. I have no idea what a shop was. I don't think we have shops anymore now with the modern way we actually harvest. But uh, apparently that's a shop. They used to leave, oh, I can't see that completely, but they used to leave that out to dry, and they would dry the corn and the, and the corn grits. And that's actually going into that the pile of uh, corn there and then getting the corn out of the, out of the husk, basically. So he was actually arrested. Another story, Mr. Baker, an observer of the seventh day, was arrested April 11, 1893, and tried before Justice Phillips of Queen Anne County on the, on the next day, basically, April 12, on the charge of ploughing on Sunday. He was sentenced to pay a fine and costs amounting to $11. Now, $11 doesn't sound much. But you can now go on the internet and figure out what a dollar was worth, say, in 1893, and what it would be worth today. So I looked, and the value of a dollar, $11 at that time, is equivalent to $2,723.56 in 2017's currency. So roughly two years ago. So it's a reasonable fine, right? Um, I think I haven't told you all the story. Here's one more. Because I've got a lot of these stories, but I'm just going to share a few with you to give you an idea of what was happening at that time. It's also 1893. Mr. Marble, another observer of the seventh day, was arrested in Queen Anne County in June 1893 and prosecuted for setting out tomato plants on Sunday, a work which occupied only a few minutes. He only did this for a short period of time, so all these tomato plants. Now, the complainant was actually his own son. Didn't Jesus actually say there that the people who would be your enemies will be people from your own household? Well, they had examples back there in 1893 already. Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 278. This was written in 1908. And we read this. It says, I have been instructed to use those discourses of yours. So she's writing to someone specific, and we'll find out who that is in a second. It was printed in the General Conference Bulletin of 1893 and 1897, which contains strong arguments regarding the validity of the testimonies and which substantiate the gift of prophecy among us. So she's writing to a pastor saying, I've been instructed. Now what does it mean when, when someone who's a prophet says, I've been instructed? Who's instructed? God. It's like God would be instructed through the Holy Spirit. That's right. Then I was shown that many would be helped by these articles. So they'll be helped. And especially those newly come to the faith who have not been made acquainted with our history as a people. Here again, the importance of our history is presented to, the, to this pastor and for all those who have come into the faith subsequent to them. Now, how many of you were living in 1893? Right, so there were, there's some new people who have come to the faith. Maybe some of our parents have, or we've been born into the Adventist Church, but all of us have been joined to the faith since that time, so it's important for us also to understand a little bit of this history. So I'm encouraged to read these conference, general conference bulletins, 1893 and 1897. Now, I read 1893 previously, probably about 20 years ago now, and then I also read 1895. And I was a little bit worried for a reason. I never read the 1897 because something happened to the particular person being dressed here and he ended up apostatizing. Now, uh, Spirit of Prophecy actually says if these men were to apostatize somewhere down the track, she wrote this in 1892, it didn't mean they didn't have a message for that time. But anyway, we keep on going. I was shown that many would be helped by these articles, especially those newly come to the faith who have not been made acquainted with our history as a people. It will be a blessing to you again to read these arguments which were of the Holy Spirit's framing. So here's he's saying that the sermons that this pastor had preached were framed by the Holy Spirit. Now I think any minister, any preacher or evangelist would love to hear that God endorses the message just simply because the message was one that came from God in the first place. 
It would be wonderful to have that endorsement, and here this pastor has that endorsement. And the reason she encourages this pastor is because he now, this is in 1908, is starting to separate himself from the church. He's lost confidence in the, in the spirit of prophecy in the church, and he's now starting to drift away from the church. And this is a last ditch effort to try and win him back to the truth. Who were these men? Well, they were Albus A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner from 1888 fame. How many of you have heard of these men? Okay, so there are some history people here, right? And this is from Testimony to Minister, page 91. It says that the Lord, in His great mercy, sent a most precious message to His people through Albus Wagner and Jones. The message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Saviour, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety, invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, receive it meaning as a gift, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. So this was the message that they brought. It was brought more prominently than in the past, and they took the law and put it in its right framework within the gospel. Matter of fact, we are told that this was all truths in a new framework. And then we go on. It says that this message that God commanded to be given to the world, it is the third angel's message. So the messages that they brought there was the three angels' message. As a matter of fact, it says three angels' message in verity. This is the essence of it. We also told in other places that the last message will go to a perishing and dying world is a revelation of the righteousness of Christ, His character of love, because God is the most misunderstood person on this planet, and there needs to be a new revelation. So it's three angels' messages, which is proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Spirit in a large measure. measure. So this is the message that God commanded to be given. This is the last message to the world, and she says it is to be proclaimed with a loud voice. This is written in 1893. Brethren and sisters, would that I might say something to you to awaken you to the importance of this time and the significance of the events that are now taking place. I point you to the aggressive movements now being made for the restriction of religious liberty. I read that before. Can you guys remember I read that before? Good. just want to make sure you are with me. I don't want to lose you along the track. So what was happening at that time is that the Three Angels' Messages was being proclaimed in a way that had never been preached before. There was power being uh, accompanying this message. At the same time, there was Sunday law being agitated. There was already a Sunday law that had been passed by Congress. And at the same time, also, people were being arrested for violating Sunday laws in at least 13 states in the U.S. and many countries around the world. Did they have reason to be concerned? Yes. Absolutely they did. Now, during 1895 and 1896, no less than 76 Seventh-day Adventists were prosecuted in the United States and Canada under existing Sunday laws. Did you know that? In two years, 1895 and 1896, 76 prosecutions of Seventh-day Adventists. That will be all through the record and all through all the Adventist media if there were two or three people being prosecuted in our time. At that time, 76. And of these, 28 served terms in various lengths in jails, and also in chain gangs. Now chain gangs is where you are forced to labor, hard labor. I didn't know this until I started looking at our history. Incredible. Back at that time. Ella White, in the context of all this, what was happening with Jones and Wagner's messages that were being presented, and they were traveling around with Ella White taking the messages to the churches after 1888, says the time of testing is just upon us. So they could see all the events were just pointing to the end of time. Well, the time of testing is upon us. Well, the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. So what was the catalyst for the time of testing? It was a revelation of the righteousness of God and the revelation of the character of God as demonstrated in the Gospel but in an end time setting. This was an understanding of truth that had probably been lost sight of since Pentecost and even the time of um, uh, the Apostle Paul. So this was being agitated and she says that the time of testing upon us, why? For. When you see that word for, there was going to say, okay, she's made a statement or the, uh, someone's made a statement and when they say for, you'll know that this is the catalyst for it. It says that the time of testing is upon us for the loud cry of the third angel has already been begun. A friend of mine has done a study in our, in our history as a church to start and try and figure out um, why we see from time to time this increase of waves of activity 
uh, even in the natural world with disasters, with earthquakes, and even sometimes famines, and you know, uh, disasters by land and sea. And he's identified a bit of a wave that happens, and typically he's been able to identify to researchers of revival and reformation within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And when that goes up, there seems to be more increase in disasters, and when that sort of ebbs down, there seems to be ebbing down as well. And I thought, well, that's a little bit odd. There might be some truth to it. I don't know. But anyway, he's, that's his, his perception on it, and it, it may help explain some of what we're talking about here. This is in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 405. Through the two great errors, and this lies in beautifully with the lesson this morning, through the two great er errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former, what is the former? The immortality of the soul. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. Protestantism will yet reach her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. She will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. This is the Roman Catholic Church. And under the influence of this threefold union, our country, that is the USA, that she's re referring to, will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. In 1955, the United States population was made up of 70% Protestants. How many Protestants make up the US population today? Any guesses? They're still quite a religious country. Yeah. A little bit better than that, 46% at the moment. But at that time, in 1955, so still in the last century, 70% of the people. So what happens is the Protestant voice is actually uh, reducing. If you keep on going in this book and you keep on reading, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 425, you'll see there that the Protestants go to the Catholics and ask them for support to actually move on government to bring in a Sunday law in America. America is the first one to do it and the other nations will follow but that's how it's going to work. And why? Well, they've lost their vote. They're no longer 70% of the population. They, they are actually losing. The church in America is going backward. And that's just because of secularism. So you actually see that they now lobby their Catholic counterparts to help them to force government to bring in a, uh, a Sunday law. Page 425. I haven't got the notes for that. Now let's look at the papacy post 1798. What happened in 1798 for uh, Bible students? He was imprisoned. Yes, so Pope Pius VI, I think, was imprisoned. He was taken captive, and a number of months later, he died in France. And then, within six months, Pope Pius VII was uh, then enthroned as the new Pope. So, I think there was about a six month gap after the death of that other Pope. So, what happened is, did the, did the church itself die? No, it didn't. The church kept on going, but it lost political power. So, that's the deadly wound. And that's why, if you go to Revelation 17, it's the beast that's wounded, not the woman. Anyway, so that's another story. I'm getting a little bit distracted. Does anyone recognize this man? You always see, probably suggest that he would be a Catholic man. Probably consider he'd be a cardinal. He's actually a pope. This is a pope that was uh, in power around 1888. I think he was made pope around 1878. And then he ruled until his death uh, around 1903. This man is a very influential pope. Matter of fact, he wrote an encyclical that's still quoted today. It's probably the most quoted encyclical in, in the Catholic um, Encyclopedia of Information. The, 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 the encyclical he wrote is Rerum Novarum. Has anyone ever heard of Rerum Novarum? Anyway, well, that encyclical is actually the basis, if you look at what other popes say, the basis of the new world order that we have nowadays. The structure of uh, our social fabric at the moment, if you look at, you go and read that, you go and read Rerum Novarum, and you look at what's happening today. It's about a hundred years later. This was released in, uh, I think it's 1891, Rerum Novarum. You can actually see a lot of things agitated and proclaimed at that time is now, is now practiced and also being implemented as we speak. Now, under his influence at the time, uh, people became uh, more devoted to Mary. He was the first pope to actually uh, have Mary as a co-mediatrix. So she's a co-mediator under, under, uh, under his leadership. Uh, he's also the one that promoted the Immaculate Conception. So we're talking from post-1798 now, right? Uh, the Adoration of Mary was promoted under him as well. There were many things that happened at that time, and the, the Pope was gaining a lot of popularity. So there's a number of things that are coming together for people to think that the end of time is right upon them. More so than we have now. And I'll read this. So the increase in natural and man-made disasters. I mentioned some of that. That big flood that killed 2,200 people there in Johnstown. 
1900 um, hurricane that came and killed uh, at least 8,000 people. And uh, the agitation of National Sunday Law, a National Sunday Law that had been passed based on funding for uh, the, the World Fair in Chicago in 1893. Persecution of Sabbath keepers in 1895 and 1896. We already had 76 people arrested, 28 who spent a time in prison. The others had to pay fines, or they maybe they got off. And some of the women were uh, in forced labor camps for a while. Then also the growing popularity of the papacy, and also the preaching of the three angels' messages in regards to the beginning of the latter rain. Now, did you know in our history that the latter rain tried to happen? God tried to pour out His Spirit on, on the church. If you go study the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, I think it's verse 27, 28 there, it talks about that I will come to you as the former rain, moderately, and also as the latter rain. Do you know the word former rain, moderately, comes as a preacher of righteousness? The latter rain was actually, the former rain was actually to grow under the teachings of the gospel. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, that you receive the Spirit of God by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. So under this preaching, the latter rain tried to happen. The, the word latter rain there actually means eloquence. So what happens is it gave eloquence to the message of, of the three angels. So all this was happening at that time. This is what Alan White writes in 1896 in regards to what happened in 1888 when Jones and Wagner presented that, what she calls the most precious message. It says, an unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through brethren E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded <coughs> excuse me, in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. So Satan was successful in something. He was agitating things, and somehow some of the leading brethren got distracted. We keep on reading. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth. Now, the efficiency is the power of God. You know, Jesus says just before his ascent, he ascends into heaven, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you'll be witnesses to me. So this was the same power, Holy Spirit power, giving um, efficiency, obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world as the apostles proclaimed after the day of Pentecost. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted. Which light is to lighten the whole earth with its glory? For those who study the book of Revelation, where do we find that light is to light the whole earth with His glory? Revelation 18, thank you. That is a, that is a symbol for the latter rain, the outpouring of the latter rain, which gives power to the three angels' messages, because you'll find the three angels' messages mentioned in Revelation 18 yet again. Glory, Babylon has fallen, come out of my people, the plagues, and so forth. It's all mentioned in there. Okay, the light of the earth with its whole glory was resisted, and by the action of our own brethren, was in a great degree kept away from the world. Was the message ever accepted? I've read a number of history books, Adventist history books, written by a number of historians in regards to the message. Some people say, yes, the message was accepted. We've moved on a long way since then. Other people say, no, the message was not accepted. Well, I like to read what Ellen White says about it, and I'd rather follow her counsel, because I think there are some revisionists. You know, if, if, if the enemy wants to put... Uh, opposition within a particular organization that's the strongest counter for his kingdom, you think he'll try and infiltrate them? Yes. I think it's quite possible. Absolutely. I see some revisionists, and I mean, they don't have to, you know, some people say we've been infiltrated by Jesuits. We may or may not have, and if we are, they're probably going to be some unlikely people that we don't even know. So I'm not, I'm not speculating on that. But I know that we have a fallen human nature, and Alan White says that the minds are fully stayed on Christ, is fully controlled by the devil. So you don't have to be a Jesuit, you just have to be unconverted, and the devil can use you. So don't worry about the Jesuits. We've got to worry about our relationship with the Lord and walking with Him and being born again. Now, this is what uh, A.G. Daniel says, a very prominent president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he wrote a book, Christ Our Righteousness, in 1926. So this is some 40-odd years after 1888, right? And he says, how sad, how deeply regrettable is it that this message of the righteousness in Christ should, at the time of its coming, have met with opposition on the part of earnest, well-meaning men in the cause of God. The message has never been received, nor proclaimed, nor given free course as it should have been in order to convey to the church 
the measureless blessings that were wrapped within it. President in 1926, 40 years later, what does he say? Message has not been proclaimed, the message has not been accepted, yet you can read some books by some um, historians, even within the Adventist Church, to say, no, it has been accepted. And that message has nothing to do with delaying the second coming of Jesus. Well, did it, or didn't it? Why are we still here if that was the beginning of the loud cry and it was the beginning of the agitation of Sunday law? What has kept things back? Well, there's only one answer I can find in the, in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 7. Now, it's interesting for those who are students of the book of Daniel as well, because you understand Daniel well, you understand Revelation so much better. Daniel chapter 11, the last few verses, probably the last five verses of Daniel 11, from about 41 through to 40, 45, it says here that the king of the north is agitated by what he hears, messages from the north and from the east. I think one of the messages from the east that agitates him must be this message here in Revelation chapter 7. Why do I say that? It says, after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea or on the land. Now what does wind represent in the Bible? Strife. Strife, warfare, <coughs> commotion. Right, so what happens is God is holding back in check, bloodshed, warfare, commotion, strife, all those sorts of things, right? And he's doing this through the medium of four angels. These, of course, are symbolic. They, they are symbols. Now what happens after that? It says, then I saw another angel ascending from where? Heaven. Thank you. Ascending, not descending. If it was from heaven, it would be descending. But it's not descending from heaven. It's ascending from the east. Now, if it's ascending, where is it being? It's being here on earth. So it's been doing a work on earth and it's bringing a message back because this angel is now recognizing that there's strife and commotion. There's an increase in natural disasters, whether it be man-mailed or be, uh, you know, floods or earthquakes or famines or any of those things. And this angel then says, I saw the angel sitting from the east having the seal of the living God. So this is a sealing message that this angel has. It says, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Now the earth and the sea are also symbols. We won't touch on that at the moment. Saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed. We. There's more than one person involved here, isn't there? For we have sealed the servants of God in their forehead. So what happened is with the rejection of the message, the persecution fires died down as well at that time. And God helped have the winds in check. Now why would God do that? Because God is in the business of saving people and as many people as possible. And sometimes when you hear a message for the first time, you don't always grasp it, do you? Sometimes I know some people have been hearing the message about the Sabbath. I just met a man, was it last week? I met a man last week. And he said to me that for 10 years I've been hearing this message of the Sabbath. And one day I was listening to a message by Stephen Ball on the Sabbath, on 3 a.m. And I grasped, I got it. Just like that. He'd been hearing it for a while. And then just through another channel, you know, we all appeal to people in different ways. He got it. So God is in the business of saying, so He holds the wind back in, in, in check so that as many people as possible can be saved. Matter of fact, we read about God's compassion and His mercy in 2 Peter chapter 3, where it says that God is not slack concerning His promises as some count slackness, but He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance and the knowledge of the truth. And that's why the promise of the second coming is delayed. It's for our sake. It's because God is in the business of saving as many as He can. So God will actually finally create a loud, a pressure environment where two character traits will be developed. Those who see God in a certain way and those who see God's true nature and God's true character. Those who know God for who He really is will love God more than they love their own lives. They will receive the seal of God. And those who have taken on the attributes of Satan, thinking that God is vindictive, that God tortures people in hell for an eternity, and all those other false doctrines that misrepresent God, they will receive the mark of the beast and his image, and they'll, they'll, they'll worship his image. So this is really what it comes down to. How much time have we got? Oh, okay, I'm running out of time. No one said anything. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize I was going over time. Pastor Byron, this morning you wanted to take time over. I've, I've, I've borrowed some of that time you wanted to use, so I apologize. Now this was written in 1900, especially highlighted in the year it was written. It says, Had the purpose of God been carried out by His people in giving to the world the message of mercy, Christ would ere this have come to the earth, and the saints would have received their welcome into the city of God. So that's from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6, page 450. 
You can also find this in Evangelism, page 694. So what does the spirit of prophecy, what does God through his prophet tell us? If the messages had been accepted, would we still be here? No. Christ would have come. She says this by 1900. No. We keep on reading also, page uh, 279, the manuscript releases. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination. We're actually repeating the history of Israel, by the way. And don't be surprised because their nature is no different to ours. We have to, may have to remain in this world because of insubordination many more years as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, these people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. Don't blame God because there has been a delay. We quite often think, well, events will just happen and then all of a sudden the Sunday law would come. Well, the Sunday law is agitated. The devil moves on government because he's trying to protect his kingdom. He can't get to the Adventists. Matter of fact, how many of you have written uh, Great Red, Great Controversy, the 1888 edition? Probably many not. The, the, the one we have is the 1911 edition. There's a little excerpt under the snares of Satan that's been taken out that's not in the 1911 edition, but it's in the 1888 edition. However, you can find it in Testimonies to Ministers. And in there, there's a blueprint of what Satan does to actually attack God's church. He starts with this, and if that doesn't work, then he escalates to that, and if that doesn't work, then he escalates to the next one. So there's there's, first of all, he tries to distract people by three things. Um, worldliness. What was the other one, Michelle? We were looking at it the other day. Worldliness. The other one is uh, lust. And then the third one is, is pride. Those three things. And then he also works through an indulgence and appetite. And also base appetites. So this, he, he, and then what happens is he confuses the mind. But if that's not successful with Adventists, then he goes to the next step. And this is yet future for us. Although in some countries it's not because they are being persecuted right now. He starts uh, kicking them off their land, they're deprived of food, they're deprived of, uh, of buying and selling. This is happening in some places in, in, in the world at the moment for, for Christians. And if that doesn't succeed, then he brings in the law where there's a death penalty. And there are some Christians who are under death penalty in certain countries at the moment. So he, he goes through a sequence of events. So the reason why we're not there is because we're not really a big threat. The big threat actually came through a revelation of the righteousness of Christ which is a revelation of the character of God. And when people see what God is really like, they fall in love with Him, and then by that love, they actually love God more than they love their own lives. And that was the big threat to, uh, to Satan's kingdom. Anyway, let's, uh, let's finish with these, these two quotes, because I have well, well truly gone over time. It says there, and I want to encourage you through this quote, because you sometimes think, well, we're not being persecuted here, so how do I know if I'm faithful or not? Well, the Bible says, be faithful in that which is least, you will be faithful also in much. Since there are many who give themselves to Christ, yet who see no opportunity for doing a large work or making great sacrifices in His service. These may find comfort in the thought that it is not necessarily the martyr self-surrender which is most acceptable to God. It may not be the missionary who has daily faced danger and death that stands highest in heaven's records. Well, that's encouraged because, I mean, none of... We're not missionaries, really are we? We're not gone to the mission fields where your life's in danger. We haven't even had to uh, give ourselves as martyred and show the demonstrate that self-surrender. But there's an encouragement to us. And the last part of the quote goes as follows. It says, the Christian who is such in his private life, is what you are in your day-to-day -day living, uh, in the daily surrender of self, in sincerity of purpose and purity of thought, in meekness under provocation, in faith and piety, in fidelity and that which is least, the one who in the home life represents the character of Christ, such a one may, in the sight of God, be more precious than even the world-renowned missionary or martyr. Isn't that beautiful? We can be encouraged. So if we're faithful in the small things, the grace of God is efficient for this day. If the big tests come, well, those who are faithful in what is least will be faithful also in much. So I pray that you would also look at God through new eyes. Spend time in the Word. Always pray before we open God's Word that the Holy Spirit will lead you into that truth. I can see a bit of a groundswell of truths and understandings regarding the character of Christ coming into the church. I have to tell you at the moment, I'm fascinated by a few things. The book of Revelation, and the other one is the revelation of the character of God. I've seen such beautiful things just in the last few months which has blown my mind. If we were playing the movie at 5.30, I perhaps would have preached on that. Um, but I wanted to give you a bit of a a persecution sermon today because it goes nicely with the movie. How many of you have uh, grabbed the book because we left some books out here, Tortured for Christ? 
Okay, quite a few of you. I don't know if we have any spare. There might still be one or two left. So you're welcome to help yourself to that. Also, if you want to, I mean, first, your first priority is always your own church. But if you want, if you have some spare money, you want to donate to Voice of the Martyrs. They always have more projects than they have money for. And if you want to help support them, whether it be a one-off donation on a monthly basis, I encourage you to do that. We have some slips here that I can provide to you, or you can go online and support them as well. But otherwise, I just want to thank you for the opportunity of sharing with you. I'm looking forward to sharing with you the movie at 5.30. I'll probably just give a brief introduction when we start. But you will be really encouraged by it, inspired by it. Don't see it as defeat when these people stand up for God and they're being persecuted. See it as victory. They'll claim victory. And Richard Wormbrand was a person that blew me away by the way that he could love his persecutors and also at the same time became fearless because love had been perfected in his heart. Let's close with prayer. Pastor Barham, or will I just pass it over to you? Close with prayer. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Father in heaven, you are our creator, our redeemer and sustainer. You are also our saviour and you have demonstrated your love for us by denying yourself for our sakes. Even while we were your enemies, you tell us in Romans 5, even while we were ungodly, even while we were without strength, and even while we were sinners. And Father, your incredible love, your goodness is what leads us to repentance. May in every heart, Father, that seed germinate. May we see the beauty of your character. May we behold and by beholding become changed through your Holy Spirit. May we all taste and see how good you really are. Bless us now as we depart from this place, Father. May your spirit go with us and may we continue to connect ourselves to you always until that day. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh. Uh-huh.